Hi everyone, my name is David, or His Witness, and as I'm going to be explaining in this video, I also go by 37. If that sounds kind of strange to you, I understand. Um, this video is going to be a compilation of a couple of my other previous videos in which I try to share the journey that I found myself on um, and the unique experience I had with this number um, that I, uh, like I said, was very unexpected that came into my life last year, but um, inspired me so much that I wrote a song about it called Indigo, and I'm going to be releasing that song soon. So this video is basically just to explain my inspiration for that and share the lesson that I learned through my experience with um, this symbolism that I saw in my life. And it's one of those things where you can take it or leave it. Um, there were many people in my life that I trust who were afraid of me talking about this um, and fear that some people would call me crazy. And unfortunately, that did turn out to be true and I was forced to take a psychological evaluation uh, to prove my mental health. Um, so I pray that you listen with open ears, but like I said, you can take it or leave it. Um, it's just an experience that I had in my personal life that I found to be quite compelling, uh, to the point where I wanted to share it with you and, and write a song about it. So again, the song is called Indigo. Um, the reason it's called Indigo is that's my favorite color. It happens to be the sixth color in the rainbow. But, um, as I talk about in the first clip of this compilation video in my story, um, the numbers that were presented in my life gave that color new meaning to me. And so, um, please listen and watch as uh, I share the first part of that journey, which comes from a segment from my story. Um, Revelation is kind of a weird book in the Bible because it's um, coded in symbolism. God um, is revealing something to John and John's writing it down and he uses all of these numbers to symbolize different things. And so he's, he's giving these prophecies of the end times um, but it's, it's not as clearly stated in other books of the Bible as in other books of the Bible. So I was always fascinated by the book of Revelation and, um, the symbolism attributed to the numbers there. Um, things like six being, uh, the number for incompleteness or six, six, six being the number for the mark of the beast. It says in Revelation, uh, the number seven, it attributes to holiness or being the number for Christ or seven, seven, seven is, uh, completeness. Um, the number 12 is also a number for completeness. You know, the number seven is God blessed the seventh day by making it holy when he created a seven day week in creation. According to the book of Genesis, uh, we have a 12 month year and two 12 hour cycles in our day. Um, the number three is attributed to the Trinity. Um, so there are other symbolisms there, but, uh, the reason I'm sharing that is it plays a part in my story later on. And I, I wanted to start here to show that the reason I even thought about numbers ever in my life is not because I'm weird and obsessed with numbers, but because, um, I was taught about revelation when I was a child. Um, let's see when I was in third grade, this is, uh, kind of like where my life really changed. Um, when I was in third grade and seven years old, I, um, and I actually want to give another warning here because, um, if anyone has ever been sexually abused, I have not been sexually abused, but what I'm about to say might be very troubling for someone who has experienced sexual abuse. And so, um, you may want to skip past this part a little bit. Um, but, uh, that being said, uh, so what happened to me in third grade when I was seven years old is I was playing at my neighbor friend's house and, um, their parents were gone for the day. And so they were being babysat by their uncle, but he was not babysitting. He was just doing his own thing. And, uh, we went, I went over to play and we went up into their parents' room and they had found their parents' pornography stash. And, um, there was this video that was playing as soon as I walked into the room and, uh, forgive me, but I, I just have to give at least a little bit of a visual of what I saw as a third grader that changed my life. Um, so on this, in this video, there were six men and one woman, and I'm just going to say that, uh, 
it wasn't loving a sexual encounter. It was abuse. And I had not even learned about sex yet. Uh, this was the first time I was seeing anything about it. And I was seeing the most perverse form of it. Uh, to me, sexual abuse is probably like the worst abuse that you can uh, be a victim of or a perpetrator of because you're using your body to abuse another person's body. And so uh, that had a profoundly negative impact on me. Um, I instantly developed a distrust for authority. Um, one of the things that happened very recently after is I had a nightmare that, and this was something I, I really couldn't share with people for a long time because I was so terrified by it. Uh, but I had a nightmare that I was in a lake of fire and there were two platforms. I was standing on one and Satan was on the other one laughing at me. As a third grader, uh, I started to feel cursed. Uh, and what I mean by that is I also started getting panic attacks about eternity. Um, it would often happen in the middle of the night. I'd start thinking about how I believed at that time that we would live forever, um, that when we die that Christ Jesus will raise us to life. And when I would try to conceptualize forever, it was terrifying to me, to the point where I would scream crying to my parents' room in the middle of the night, and uh, they didn't know what to do for me. Um, it's a weird thing to be afraid of living forever. I've since put it together that it's because I was conceptualizing forever within the understanding of this world or the confines of this world. And to think about evil lasting forever is a horrifying thought. So I was introduced to one of the worst evils that there can be. And then I associated that with eternal life. And it was terrifying to me. Um, the other thing that made me feel cursed is I mentioned <clears throat> how in the book of Revelation that there's a number 666 attributed as the mark of the beast or for Satan. And I started to realize or put together that I'm the sixth child of my parents and that I was born in the sixth month, not just the sixth month, but 630, the last day of the sixth month, like the closest you can get to seven without being there. And uh, my favorite color has always been indigo, which is the sixth color in the rainbow. And these are all dumb things. Uh, and you can say they mean nothing. But for me, after I experienced that as a child uh, and with my religious upbringing, I started to put those things together and feel like I was marked with the mark of the beast. It's like I could lie and say that my favorite color was a different color. But I would be lying because I really love indigo. I've always been drawn to the complexity of it. It's different than the other colors. It's kind of like two colors mixed together. And I always loved that and just think it's a pretty color. So anyway, this really, um, it's like I had faith in Jesus and I believed that. But I also had this nagging uneasiness inside of me. And it stemmed from this experience. Um... It, it also made me start asking questions that I hadn't really asked before, uh, some that I started out with, but others like, why did God allow Satan into his perfect garden when he could have walled it off and kept Adam and Eve protected? I, I never really understood that, and so um, I started wanting to know the answer to that. Another question was, I remember thinking, I was born into a Christian family, but what about a little boy or girl who's born into a Buddhist family or a Catholic family or a Jewish family or an atheist family or whatever? Uh, how do I know I'm right? And how do they know they're wrong? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, we all start at different points. So we all have to own our faith for ourselves. Um, the other question that I had is, why won't we sin anymore when we get to heaven? Why will we now? Why do we now? But it says uh, one term that I had heard growing up at the school I went to was we'll be confirmed in our holiness. And I, I never understood that either. So um, I, it sent me off on a journey to see if there were answers to those questions. And in the Bible, it says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. 
I took that to mean, hey, maybe if I dig into the Bible, I'll find these answers. I want to talk to you about um, something that uh, many people in my life that I trust and admire uh, have told me that I shouldn't talk about because I'll sound crazy. Um, and it has to do with numbers. So that's why I talked about the numbers at the beginning of my story and why I even had any associations with them. It was from the book of Revelation that I was taught as a boy. Um, so if they sound crazy, I guess you can blame the Bible. Um, but for me, I, I, I did take that seriously. And I, the, the symbolism that is used in the book of Revelation, um, that meant something to me, and I was always fascinated by it. I was also always fascinated by there's this scroll that, as John is being told the different scrolls to write down the information and, and put it in the Bible for us, there's one that God gets to, and he says, but don't write that down. And I was always fascinated by what that secret is. What What is there that God knows that we can't know now, but he is going so far as to tell us that he's not telling us? That's very interesting to me. It always was. Um, so um, I started seeing a number in my life that just led to a, a kind of a weird place. And it, um, so the number was 37. And the, where it first appeared, first of all, um, I want to talk to you about what my grandma used to say on our birthdays. So if, it was, if I was turning like five years old, she would say you're in your sixth year. And that's because when you're born, you're technically zero until you reach your first birthday. And then you've achieved one and then you're in your second year. So this last year, I was in my 37th year, but I was 36 years old. Um, I watched the Disney Pixar movie, Soul. And in that movie, I love that movie. I recommend it if you haven't seen it. But there's this place called The Great Before, where they're talking about where souls are kind of put together. And um, one of the little souls is called 37. And the instructor says... 37, quiet down, quiet coyote, or something like that. And um, I didn't really subconsciously pick it up at the time. Um, but then uh, I wrote a song, the song I'm going to be releasing next. It's called The Great Unknown. And um, that song is all about me professing that I'm no longer afraid of eternity, that the panic attacks have no hold over me anymore. And... Um, you know, when you write a song, one of the things you have to get right and nail down is the beats per minute, the BPM. And because you don't want the song to sound too rushed or like it's dragging. So you want it to be in that perfect groove. And the beats per minute for that song was 137. And uh, so again, it's just like, okay, whatever. It wasn't really making anything of it yet. Um, then on 3 6 of 21, March 6th, excuse me, I uh, had a, just a. A very heavy emotional day. I was distraught about the placement battle that I was in, and I was worried that I had put trust in my ex-wife that maybe I shouldn't have, and I was worried about if she really would say good things about me, and that maybe it would keep me from seeing my daughter. Um, I just, I wanted to trust her, and I did, but I was scared, and I was even like, I was crying for most of the day about it. I was just besides myself, and I even asked my mom to come over just to give me a hug, which is something I don't think I've ever done. Um, so it was a, just a really weird black day. Um, but then on 3 7 and this is what was kind of strange, and this is where I also have to get into mentioning someone else's story. But I want to emphasize before I do that that I am absolutely not trying to disparage my mom. I love my mom. My mom is like the best mom in the whole world. She has been so incredibly loving and kind my whole life. She takes being a mom so seriously, and she is awesome at it. I love her to the moon and back and beyond. Um, but something that was a secret uh, was that she had had a child before she married my dad. and. The reason I'm bringing that up is all at once on 3-7, I realized that <laughs> this fictitious mark of the beast that I had placed on myself or thought was there in my life when I was a boy and for whatever reason that 
serpent of chaos, you could say, was allowed into my life, that pornography which changed everything for me, spiritually and mentally and emotionally and everything, um, I suddenly realized that I wasn't the sixth child of my mom. I was the seventh child of my mom's and the sixth child of my dad's. And then I realized, too, that I was born on 630, but I was baptized into God's family in July, in the seventh month. And then I realized the color indigo, you know, I said it's not really its own color. It's, it's sort of a deception in that it's two colors mixed together. It's blue and violet. It's the sixth color, but what makes it beautiful is the seventh color. And by the way, violet is the color for royalty or for our king, and seven is the color for Jesus. What makes the sixth color beautiful is the violet bleeding into the blue. I think that's really great symbolism for what Christ does in this life for us. Blue is sometimes a color attributed to earth. It's mostly water. Uh, blue is also attributed to sadness, feeling blue, the blues. Christ did bleed into our blue and made us beautiful. It's interesting because there are three primary colors, but there are seven colors in the rainbow. Um, I mentioned to you the 36 and the 37. So then I was like, okay, is there any like biblical significance to these numbers? And so I did some studying and research on them. And it turns out that there is. So it said not to think, a couple different sources said not to think of 37 as 37, but as three sevens, 777. Seven, seven. And not to think of 36 as 36, but as three sixes, 666. Six, six. I was born on 630, which is 36 backwards. So now at this point, I'm just kind of like, it's like, okay, I've seen this weird pattern in my life. Um, and you can say, that's dumb. It's whatever. And I'll accept that. <laughs> I'm not making an inve any investment decisions off of these numbers or anything like that. But at the same time, it was incredibly touching for me because that nagging feeling that I had I realized that if you go back deep enough, there's explanations for just about everything. And that sent me on a kind of like a weird spiritual, it, it like unlocked something in my brain. And I, I wanted to look back at the numbers in Revelation. It's like we the passage in Romans, it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Um, in all things. We believe that even in the dark times, God is able to turn those and twist those into something beautiful for his people. And uh, I started thinking about maybe God, if he could do this in my life, why can't he do it in everyone's life? Um, I said the, the numbers that I was going to get back to that. So when that happened, on 3-7 and I started digging into the 7-7-7 seven, seven, seven and, and how the 7s can even use the 6s, so to speak, to bring about the 7s. And what I mean by that is God, who is perfect, can even use the bad stuff, the evil and sin of this world, to create something beautiful for his purpose. I was fascinated by two sections in Revelation that I want to talk to you about. The first one comes from Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven and on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. 
Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and, open it, and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for, for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. I'd like to read verse 13 again. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and, on under, and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory forever and ever. What stuck out to me about that passage is, so this, he was weeping because no one was worthy to open the scroll to the book of life, meaning we'd all be dead. But then a lamb who had been slain, Christ Jesus, who lived a perfect life and suffered the death that we deserved and conquered death for us and rose again. He is worthy to open the scroll, be scroll because he is perfect and he is the perfect sacrifice. Um, it says, after he has taken the scroll to the book of life, that every creature, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth is singing. And forgive me, but if the scroll to the book of life has been opened and my name is not in it. Yes, I'll acknowledge God as Lord, but I'll be screaming and terrified. I think the last thing I'll be doing is singing praises at that moment. I'll be screaming um, because I'm about to go to hell forever. That, that was interesting to me. And so there's another um, section in Revelation 7. And this section is titled, The 144,000 Sealed. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. And then it lists 12,000 people from each of the 12 tribes. Now, some people have taken that literally to mean that only 144,000 people of all of the people that have ever existed are going to be in heaven. I personally think that sounds wrong. Um, I think it's probably symbolic since there's symbolism used with numbers throughout the whole book of Revelation. And it's this, so in Revelation 5, it was 24 elders or 12 plus 12, completeness plus completeness. And then in Revelation 7, it's 144,000 or 12 times 12,000, completeness times completeness. And I started wondering, is that referring to the full body of all of God's creation? And, and it made me think about, in the beginning, before God created the heavens and the earth, there's just nothing. There's just God. Or think of it as like, God is the universe. He's just the galactic goo that binds all of us together. He is the blank canvas. And he, just, he was complete unto himself. Um, he didn't have to take time out of his day that day to sit down and create a masterpiece, a work of art. But uh, our father did sit down and draw on the blank canvas of himself a work of art. 
And uh, I was thinking about how if I ever make draw a picture or I write a song, that a piece of me is in that song. Or like with my children, I have a piece of them in my heart and they have a piece of me in theirs. Um, but it's like I've put something into that work of art, that a piece of me is in that. And I think in that sense, that there's a piece of God in all of us, and you could say likewise, uh, us and him, that we're a piece of his body of work. He made all of us, and he tells us in his word that he loves all of us equally. He tells us in his word that he wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. He tells us, we find out in his word, that Satan's only allowed to do what God allows him to do. That God has all power. He's all-knowing. He's had literally forever, eternity before he created this world to devise his master plan of salvation. And if he wants all men to be saved and God is all-powerful, um, then it comes down to free will. So it's like this. It's like, God created, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and in six days he made everything, and on the seventh day he rested and blessed it, calling it holy. Uh, but he made this perfect, orderly creation. He said everything was good and perfect. And then he put his two people in the middle of the Garden of Eden and said they were perfect. And it was a little bit of heaven on earth. It doesn't even say that God created hell in the beginning. Um, some people have assumed that he must have afterwards, after the fall, but <clears throat> the truth is that God's word doesn't say that specifically. Um, later on, it says that the angels and demons will go to the place that was prepared for them. But originally, this world was prepared for all of us, including them. So that God created the heavens and the earth. And so he made these people. And I was thinking about, again, I'm not God, obviously, thankfully. Uh, I am only one of his created people. But I was thinking about if I was and I had the power to create like that, if I had some clay and I was able to mold it into a little guy and then had a couple of these clay guys, and then if I was able to breathe life into them, and then if I was able to give them the very precious gift of free will, being able to make their own choices, to choose to love me or not, to listen to me or not. I'm thankful for the gift of free will. I wouldn't want to be a mindless robot. Um, so God gave them that. And then God allowed something strange. And I asked this question earlier is, why did God allow this serpent of chaos to slither through the cracks of the walls of the garden and come in and stoke the fire a little bit, so to speak? He raised some doubt and even asked a question and then even lied. Uh, he says, did God really say this? You will surely not die. So here's Eve, who has just been placed in this perfect creation and told that it's all for her good and told she can eat of any tree, just stay away from the one. And then comes this serpent straight out of hell. She must have thought, like, where did this thing come from telling me that this is all evil and for my bad and that, this, that my father's lying to me? She must have panicked. And in that moment, she made a bad choice. She believed the lie. And then she gave it to her husband, and he also believed the lie. And then they, they wanted to hide, and they felt separated from God. Their sin made them feel separated. And God says, you know, God doesn't said, say he's going to kill them, but he says, you're going to die now because the wages of sin is death. Sin kills. Evil kills, eventually. And he said, cursed is the ground now because of you. Cursed. We use that cursing, like cursing to hell. He said, cursed is this ground now. And then he says to the serpent, to Satan, he says, cursed are you to the ground all the days of your life. And then God casts Adam and Eve out of that heaven on earth out of Eden. They can't get back in. No matter how hard they try on their own merits, they cannot get back into that heaven on earth. They're trapped here to die. 
so the question that I started asking is, like, God's word doesn't say that God created hell, and that he, would, he never intended for us to be there. He wanted for us to stay in perfect communion with him. But then he allowed this serpent of chaos into their life, like a serpent of chaos was allowed into my life. And I thought, why? And I thought, maybe it's to bring about greater understanding. I don't know. But God promised to them after he cast them out of that perfect garden, he said, I will send my son, and he will provide the way out. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And only through him can you come back to heaven. So I started asking myself, if God cursed this ground and he didn't create, it doesn't say he created hell, did we create hell by separating ourselves from God with sin? And is this hell on earth? And that's a crazy thing to think and, and say, and it's something that's different than what I've thought about for a long time. But God's word, you have to add to it to say that he created hell. Um, so this is something I want to talk about with people and hear what you have to think. Um, you know, I'd, this isn't actual hell because there's a way out still. Real hell is after the final day when Christ takes those who believe in him and want to be with him to heaven with him where he is now. Those who want to stay left behind can stay left behind, it seems. And... At that point, there's no way out. Hell is forever. Because there has to be a time when that door to evil is shut. And I'm thankful for that. But we have a time of grace right now. And what's interesting is getting back to... So it, we talk about how Jesus descended into hell after he was crucified. Well, the light of the world came to shine in our darkness. But... And he was perfectly loving to everyone. But for a moment, we snuffed out that light. The darkness murdered him. God, who came down to save us because he loves us. We murdered him when he was perfectly loving and just told the truth. So for those three days, which I think are also symbolic of Christ's 33 years, he came to visit us in hell on earth here. Those three days when we murdered God here, our hope had been in vain. Had he not risen, we would be trapped. But thankfully, he did rise, and God was not trapped here in hell. He rose victorious and conquered the grave. And through him, all of us can conquer the grave. If God provided a way out through his son for Adam and Eve, who created the original sin, how much more so is he trying to work out his plan of salvation in the lives of all of his created people? Now, I've been thinking a lot about baptism and communion. So, at the church I go to, you don't have to know anything about your faith to be baptized. We baptize babies, infants, and they don't understand it, but we baptize them into God's family. It's a symbolic thing that God tells us to do with the water and the word, that we are then made heirs of Christ. Um, and I've been thinking about baptism by fire. We're thrown into the fire here. God threw us into this world and allowed for this chaos to come. And what this chaos is, is every man for himself. It's free will run rampant. We're all serving ourselves and seeing the consequences of our sin and, and learning that God's law is true and that what he says is right and designed for our good. And when we come to the end of ourselves in this baptism by fire, I believe that we will have learned the consequences of our sin and have gained an understanding from our experience. You know, Adam and Eve didn't have the benefit of experience when they made their first choice, but then they did experience the consequences of sin. And it's a combination of that law being sealed on our hearts and minds and knowing where evil leads to. And also the gospel of Christ and his grace, his undeserved love that he'll give to us, that he's waiting for us, just like in the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son is a parable of a boy who ran off and spent his inheritance from his father on wild living and his own 
plans and his own will. And then he realized that it was not the life he wanted, and he missed his father. And he ran back home, and while he was still a long way off, his father greeted him with open arms. I think of God the Father as the great prodigal father. He's perfect, so he didn't run off, but he's the father of the prodigal son, of all of the prodigal children. So I believe that the great prodigal father, Christ, the head of the church, wants to call all of his children back unto himself, his whole body of work, and that when we take communion and we take and bite a piece of Christ, we're remembering, first of all, what it took to win our salvation, that he had to come and allow himself to be murdered in our place, but also to remind us that we are a part of his body. We're a part of him. And he wants his complete, full body of work. He tells us that plainly in his word. And so when we are called and witness to the light of salvation, he says, you are now my hands and feet. Christ is the head, and your hands and feet are out to call the rest of his body back into himself. So that's our job. Everybody starts out at different points. You know, it's like I was thinking about how if someone's in hell, they've chosen to be there. But here's the thing that I also want to say is, as someone who's going in to be a mental health professional, I believe that all mental illness is the result of sin and evil. That if there was no evil, there'd be no mental illness. And that over the generations, it's compounded and compounded as parents who have found themselves rooted in evil ways are now having children who learn from that and it compounds and compounds and we've, the light has been distorted into darkness. I think that if someone at this point right now in their life says, I want to go to hell and I want nothing to do with God, that's because they are so mentally ill from the evil of this world that they don't even know what's good for them. They're lost. Jesus, even when he was being murdered on the cross, said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave them even then. The thief on the cross is a great example. His whole family looking up at him might have thought his life was crap and he he's going to hell because his life just looked terrible. He was doing everything wrong. But in his final moments, intimate moments with his Savior, he expressed his faith. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. So judge not lest you be judged. I think most people kick the can down the road with regard to their existence and mortality as far as they can kick it. And some maybe until it can be kicked no further and they're on their deathbed. They say your whole life flashes before your eyes. Is it possible that all of the witnesses who've crossed their path and all of the experience or truths that they've heard in their life and previously rejected for whatever reason that those come to them in those final moments? I don't know. I think it's certainly possible. I think it puts God in a box when you say it's not possible for him to work out his plan of salvation in someone's life. I think you go too far if you say that you know someone's in heaven or you know someone's in hell. And I want to be clear in saying that I don't know. And that's the point. It's not my place to judge. It's only my place to be a light, to shine as a witness to the light. In the beginning, the word that the very first words that spoke into the darkness were let there be light. And Christ Jesus was the word that spoke those words. And he was that first light. And we weren't witness to that light then because we weren't yet born. But I feel like I'm a witness to that light now and I have seen it. And I believe that when Christ comes, that he's going to take me with him to heaven. And I believe I'm in the Bible right now. And what I mean by that is that sealed scroll to the book of life, I'm confident that I'm in that scroll. I just can't see it yet because only one is worthy to open the scroll. And that's Jesus Christ, the Lamb. This next clip is taken from the most recent um, testimonial that I gave in which I shared a very difficult, in fact, the most difficult experience I've ever been through where I felt it was God's will to leave the church that I was raised in um, and the reasons why I chose to do that. Um, through this experience, I, I found this pattern with the numbers show back up in the very word of our God. And so I found that even more compelling to the point where I wept bitterly um, several times uh, when I'd read this section of scripture. It's one of those things where if I had read it at any other point in my life, it, I don't think it would have had any meaning to me. 
you know, I firmly believe there are no coincidences in this life and that God is never early and he's never late. He's always right on time. So I found this to be quite moving and it um, encouraged me in my walk of faith as I was going through this very difficult experience. But it also happened last year <clears throat> that really inspired me to tell my story. Yeah. And I've mentioned this already is I had a friend take his life. And so that's kind of what led me down that path. I had been real apprehensive about sharing my story prior to that because I, I was afraid of the reaction, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, but that inspired me to do it. And so I put together a couple, um, videos to one to prep that and, and explain the new, um, direction that I was taking to share my story. And then I released a song, uh, called don't fit the box. And, um, the song is all about, uh, there's a lyric that says, don't waste a moment more, run through that open door. There is no one else who can do it quite like you do. Um, then uh, the video that we made for that, I was inspired to actually make a door. Mm -hmm. And uh, throughout the video, I'm running through this door. Um, and the other thing that I had shared in my story was how I had had this kind of interesting experience with the numbers and revelation when I first experienced um, the panic attacks in my life. And I shared how last year I had sort of this, not sort of this pretty grand flipping of that experience. Um, and so I shared that and uh, that I had this interaction with the numbers and revelation of uh, three and seven and six and seven. Those are prominent numbers that are listed in symbolism there that, again, I share more detail on in my story. So I'm going to um, skim over that for now. Uh, but so in preparing to tell my story, I, um, I didn't want to tell anybody else's story as much as possible. I wanted to stick to telling mine. Uh, but there were a couple people that I wanted to ask per permission from. One was my ex-wife, because uh, I knew that I wouldn't wanted to share my experience with the divorce, but I wanted to do it in a way that you know, we had been getting along really, really well at that time, and I wanted to share it in a way that would um, that we could both be happy with, mm -hmm. you know. And um, right. I had also talked to my friend's mom that I could talk about what happened with him and, mm -hmm. and how that motivated me, and I talked to my own mother because I shared aspects of her story. Um, but so, you know, I, before I released the story, I had a meeting with this pastor, um, to say, I've got some spiritual questions that I'm raising in my story. Mm -hmm. Um, they're, they're nothing different than any questions I wouldn't raise in Bible class. Um, and I'm posing them as questions and I wanted to talk to you about them. Um, uh, but to get through it, it would take like two hours and I understood he's a busy guy. So the plan was that he would listen to the podcast of it. And then we had a meeting set the following week to uh, talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, when I, uh, and, and <laughs> during that exchange that week, when we talked about meeting up again to talk about the questions. Um, so this was right before I told my story on, on this page. Um, we had also talked about, I was excited to, for being a part of the worship team the next year and, and singing songs and talked about meeting together for that. So the reason I'm saying that is up until this point and from the last meeting that we had had, where I met with all three of them, there had been no indication to me that there was anything wrong. Mm -hmm. I was not uh, told anything was wrong or they weren't asking me to leave and were in fact very much giving the impression that things were fine. Um, no other questions or meetings had taken place with regard to uh, me playing outside of their fellowship. I had never done that. I had only played with uh, for one church uh, in the area here. That's a sister church. Um, but so what happened is then I told my story and I started receiving uh, messages and um, from people at the church leadership there. One of the teachers there, in response to me telling my story, said, get mental help. Um, 
her husband, when I had talked to him, he's also a teacher there, uh, said that it sounded like I was playing the victim when I was trying to share my feelings about the situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, leading up to that, one of the experiences that led me on this um, journey in the Word of God was I had heard uh, a pastor, one of the pastors there preaching from the pulpit that he knows that Judas is burning in the fires of hell. And the reason I mentioned that is um, I talked to one of the other pastors there and he said that he knew that not only are there for sure millions of people in hell, but that he knew his own grandma was in hell. Mm -hmm. And I, it, so I started having those weird experiences too, like doctrinal issues. And, and I was already kind of struggling with how they appeared to be struggling with the doctrine of marriage and just flippantly, right. you know, how they treated that. And so I'm going through all of this stuff and receiving this backlash and and then not only did that pastor who said that he knows his grandma is in hell, I, you know, I said that I was starting a podcast. Mm -hmm. And the point of it was so that if anyone had questions about my story, that they could ask me. And then they, so they could share their stories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I told him I wanted to start out, you know, with other spiritual leaders, but I wanted to start out with them as a foundation of truth is the way that I put it. Mm -hmm. And he uh, said, not only do I think this is absolutely wrong, but then he went and like warned the other pastor that I had next on the list that I shared with him that I also wanted to talk to. And so I, I started wondering like, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. I'm seeing all of this rotten fruit from the leadership, you know, um, personally and doctrinally. And so then I want to share before I get to the end here is I was uh, deeply, deeply lamenting this situation that I had found myself in and how I got into this trouble for trying to, you know, be a light to shine for my friends, but also to witness for Christ. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go into God's word here. And, you know, I had been drawn to the book of Revelation. And so I, I opened up to Revelation 3 verse 7. And um, automatically, I was just kind of impacted by it because, and and this is a really hard thing to talk about, but I have to. Uh, I was drawn to it because exactly at that verse, um, the book of Revelation starts out with God is giving these messages, some of them warnings, some of them encouragements to the seven churches in Revelation. Mm -hmm. And this, at, starting at 3 verse 7, it starts, it's talking about the sixth of the seven churches. And, you know, I, I was drawn to that because for whatever reason, I had just felt inspired to be talking about those numbers only a couple months before. And it had happened just a couple months before, but right. then right now I was talking about it, you know, right. and sharing it in my story. And also right now I had just, um, I had felt inspired to write this sort of random song that was much different than any other songs that I had written. And it was one of those where like my song, children of the light, the first one that I recorded, it just felt like it was already there, you know? And like, I was just the hand writing it down. It was very inspired and, um, it's all about this open door. Yeah. <laughs> so I mentioned that because, okay, so I'm, feeling really, really down from this, what I feel to be persecution going on from my church. Right. Right. And then starting at revelation three, verse seven, it's speaking to the six of the seven churches. And it says to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write: These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have little strength, Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, 
which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So I'm reading this, and, you know, my name is David, and, it, you know, it says my name in there, but I'm named after David from the Bible. But, right. you know, there's, there's these exact same numbers that I just got done talking about in my story. Uh, very, very specifically because of the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for whatever reason, I'm inspired to write this lyric about running through an open door and then inspired to make a door and I'm running through it in this video. And then a couple months later, my very first paid position as a mental health professional was at a place called The Open Door, mm -hmm. which gets its name from God's Word mm -hmm. and helps anybody can come off the street and, and receive help. And, right. And so I have, I'm just like loaded with this symbolism. Yeah. And it's, yeah. you know, it's a prophetic book of things to come. And, you know, I've, I've, I've broken down crying several times because the thing that really did it for me was it's talking about the synagogue of Satan, these Jews who claim to be Jews, they are, though they are not. And in today's world, you might say Christians, you know, who claim to be Christians, though they are not. And. You know, I was feeling this in my life. I was feeling people lying about me or persecuting me because I'm trying to serve my God. Yeah. Quite yeah. honestly, like I didn't, I wasn't trying to gain any popularity points from this. I was trying to witness my faith through my own testimony of my life and how I felt God has been working in my life yeah. and also raise questions and say I'm on this journey. Right. And call people to talk to me about it. Well, I think, yeah, I think we're all kind of seeking those doorways, right? <laughs> right, and I'm inspired yeah. because of what I'm seeing, the pain in my friends around me. Right, right. So, you know, then I go the following week. You know, we had had this meeting to talk about it, and instead I find out that they've blocked my access to get into the church. Yeah. That I've been kicked out of the band. When I asked him to come over to my parents' house to tell me why, it's like in the work that I do today, when we make a big decision uh, of like detaining someone against their will or something, we have to have a whole list of rationale, you know, right. and reasons why we did it at the ready. When I asked him, he had no reasons at the ready, none. Uh, the only reason he listed was that someone had complained and... Uh, he had talked about the spiritual questions that I raised, but even admitted, okay, they were brought up as questions and where I was opening the door for people to talk to me about it. And so I asked twice more on different occasions. And then things started, reasons started to come out, you know, like when you're fighting with a loved one and all of a sudden this laundry list of stuff comes out. One of them was that I had talked about playing at different churches well, that's no, because we had already discussed that. I right. hadn't played anywhere else, and we were going to be discussing it more. And also, he didn't say it initially. So I didn't actually do anything wrong there, even in their eyes. Uh, and it hadn't been brought up in the five months leading up to that. Right. It was only after I told my story that there was a change. Mm -hmm. uh, then they brought out other reasons eventually. Um, one of them was saying that one of the questions I talked about with the people in the flood, that, that I was wrong in my, uh, my hypothesis there. Um, but I asked, you know, point from God's word where you can tell me that, and he's never been able to do that. So then he says, I'm done talking about it, and if you want, we can talk at a different church about it, but um, otherwise you can direct your complaints to the Board of Elders. And so then I go through the process, which take months, takes months of, um, I talk to, they have one rank where you go through a circuit pastor. And, uh, the only thing he said to me after I tried to explain the situation to him was David, you know, it's wrong to do drugs. Uh, so he was very short and, um, not em empathetic whatsoever with trying to understand the situation. Right. The board of elders, once it got to that point, several months down the road, I had uh, one meeting where I was allowed to talk and share my, my experience for about 40 minutes. But then there were several subsequent meetings where I was not allowed there. 
Yeah. And at this point, I'm saying like I would have more rights if I was arrested in the court of law because at least there I'd be able to cross-examine and, right. and be present each time my name is discussed and defend myself. So I have no idea what was said behind those closed doors. Yeah. And then, so getting down, we're almost there. Uh, then coming to that same week where I had first talked to the Board of Elders is um, we had Bible class that week. And when this incident first happened September, I felt myself unable to sing in church anymore. Right. That's how deeply I was impacted by it. And, but so I tried to go to Bible class because I thought maybe I can have a voice there. And it just so happened that the topic for the day was divorce and marriage and yeah. that this pastor was leading it. So I asked zero personal questions. I asked two questions pertaining to the word of God. One was, I asked what were the reasons that God gave for um, even considering divorce. And he shared that they were uh, unfaithfulness and abandonment. And I said, what would you do if you were in a situation where that was in question? He said, well, I would try to counsel them and, and talked about what would be a good way to handle it. Mm -hmm. But then I asked, I said, what does God's word say about if a woman or a husband um, divorces their spouse and marries another uh, that they commit adultery? Are there any exceptions to that? And he had already asked a hypo hypothetical question in this Bible class. But now all of a sudden he said to me, we're not going to be discussing the ins and outs of divorce today. So it's like that was the topic for the day. Mm -hmm. If anyone else had asked that question, I'm betting that he would have been able to answer it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm just saying like, this was kind of the full circle to me is, Right. He's tried to silence me after I just told my story, which I shared what happened in the divorce and that I yeah. didn't feel that I abandoned the marriage. Um, he silenced me at Bible class when the very topic was that topic. Had it been someone else, I think he would have felt more comfortable talking about it. But because we had that history, and I believe because he felt guilty over how he handled it yeah. and knowing that it was wrong, that then he silenced me again. Yeah. And so ultimately, you know, it's interesting, the seventh church in Revelation talks about a church that's either hot nor cold, and they were not making a decision on this. They were just lukewarm. And finally, I actually shared that section of scripture with them, and they made their decision, and they silenced me again with a letter and said, we're not going to be talking about this anymore. Yeah, yeah. So I was accused of abandoning my marriage, but I feel that they abandoned this marriage of being my shepherds. I was accused of not being above reproach, I guess, but it I volunteered out of the most broken days of my life. I feel that he abandoned and he was not above reproach. Um, and so I, ultimately it's like, how, how can I possibly, I had no choice but to leave, right? you know? So as I close here today, brothers and sisters, the lesson that I wanted to share is this. Um, we all come into this world marked with the mark of the beast, so to speak. We we all struggle with the evil that surrounds us and the evil in our own hearts. God gives us this time of grace, but if it were only up to us, we would stay marked with that imperfection, that 666. Thankfully, that's not the end of the story, though. Christ, our perfect king, did come to bleed into our blue and make us beautiful. So now, like it says in Revelation 5, we're all given a new seal of perfection, 777, three sevens, and made holy, bought back, redeemed by Christ our seed. So I want to encourage you in these dark times, in these end times, to keep your eyes fixed on the one, Christ Jesus, our hope and our salvation. He's coming soon, very soon. May he give us strength to be his hands and feet and to shine the love that he first gave us. I love you all. Thank you all for being with me on this journey. I don't know where it's going to end up, where it'll lead, but I do know the one that walks besides me and is always next to me. God be with you, brothers and sisters.